Shalom Vacha, thank you so much for coming and joining us this wonderful evening. Thank you, Balabait, for opening the doors of your house, like Abraham, our father, that opened his house to bring people to enjoy the light of heaven, the light of faith, the light of the truth. Every single person on earth is a different soul, has a different journey, different purpose in his life, different mission, a unique one. The problem that we all are experiencing, suffering from, is our low self-esteem. This is an issue that needs to be discussed every day between us to all our loved ones to try to see how to bring ourselves back up above the surface of the water for the foreign water, for the evil water, not to make us drown in the sadness, despair and heaviness of the darkness of exile. When we are walking around between people and everyone has something to say, and everyone holds his opinion and his ways and deep understandings that are based on the foundations of his life experience and gallons and gallons of scotch that he drank in his life. It makes us very vulnerable for abuse, for criticism, for severe and negative energy toward us that destroys our emotional structure that is abusing us, that is making us to become victims in the hands of others. And people like we know allow themselves to open their mouths wildly, widely and wildly, and to say whatever they want and not to have no compassion to the feelings and emotions and and reality, the balance, the, 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 the thin ice that we are barely uh, walking on. And like we're saying, life and death are in the hands of the tongue, of the mouth. person can just like explode on you, his rage, his anger, his frustration, his low self-esteem, his bad black bitterness that he is like holding, and he will just he's gonna throw it all on you with no compassion, without understanding the consequences of his act. And he just like shot your leg, he just made a hole in your boat, and you're sinking, and you're drowning, and like, he, he already sailed, he's elsewhere, he's not there to help you to deal with what he caused, with his hands, with his words. And we finding ourselves so sensitive and so fragile and, 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 and so helpless in those situations, being hurt and even betrayed and, and abused by our loved ones. I spoke with a friend of mine yesterday that he himself, he came out of Christianity, out of his um, family's uh, culture and religious and religion and found Judaism for him satisfying and answering questions and, and issues in his life and found happiness, found truth in it. Really happy to go back to the source, to the Bible, to learn only from the first and only testament and like found himself and joyful and happy. But when he came and started talking about it with his family, and we're talking about an around 50 years old person, his children started to fight with him and told him, what's that story with Judaism? We're never going to be Jewish. We don't want that. Like, and we can understand. Like, they have their friends. They have their school. They have their church. They have their life. Like you, you can't, No, listen, Judaism, that's the truth. And I love... Not everyone went through what you went through in your life to, to understand what in the world you're talking about. Like, Jews, like, like, we heard only bad things about them until you came up with your ideas. Like, who knows? Like, what are you talking about? So different, so crazy, so wild. 
And if you want to get crazy, so go with your craziness. Don't, don't rock our boats. Like we have our lives, we have like our future. We want to get married. We want to like I have a boyfriend. I need to date with him. Like my crazy father is destroying my life now. And we need to understand to respect each other from every angle. But in reality, he must fly for his life. He must find what that is shining from within. And his children, they're suffering. For them, from their perspective, their father lost his mind. Like, the house is now being destroyed in front of their eyes. And he found something. What should he do with that? Drop it? Keep on going to church when his life is elsewhere? Like, he finds life. He finds joy. What should he do? So we are finding, and that's an example. It's a great example. It's a whole life story of a poor guy, of a poor children, of a family. But in reality, it's an example, one of billion, of stories. When I started my tshuva process, I'm Jewish from birth. When I told my father that I want to do tshuva and I want to start keeping Shabbat, he looked at me, he told me, don't make a joke out of yourself, turned his back on me and went. And that was the beginning. That's how it started. That was the first conversation. <laughs> it went very, very far down the road. It went very, very low. Things went very, very bad. My mother, she was even more radical than him with what she told me. She told me I would rather you to be gay than religious. So, okay, as a child, you need to deal with it. Like, I was 19 years old, and I like 20 years old, and I like... I want to do something, I found something, like you come to your parents, you're like, hey guys, look, there is a sham in the world, like, go back to your whole crazy creature, what are you talking about, like, the, <laughs> like the, and that's the energy, when you wake up, the world wants to turn you off, and it's not that people are evil, my mother, she's not evil, my father, he's not evil, like, they're poor people, they don't know, they like, for him, for my father, it's like, we were driving bikes together, riding bikes together, we were going to the sea, we were like, we were having fun, we would go to restaurants, and like, he lost his son in a way. He really, like, something happened, like, I didn't die, thank God, but like, we're not hanging out together anymore, like, we cannot go to the gym anymore, we're not swimming anymore, we're not going to the beach anymore, like, something really happened to him, and you must understand that. You must understand that every person is a story. And we need to understand that, first of all, to respect each other and to understand that people are alive. You cannot go and say, no, you would disqualify people, erasing people, criticizing people, because you don't know what's going on. You can never know. You can never know what is hidden inside of a soul, inside of a person's mind. I spoke today with a person that told me a story about, um, um, like, he was a, a Star of David on his necklace. And he is not completely Jewish. He knows that he has some 50-something percent Sephardic uh, uh, um, Jewish DNA in his, in his blood. And, like, he wants it. He loves it. He has a passion for, for Israel and for Torah and for whatever. And he desires Judaism. He, practice in Judaism, but probably still, if really wants to be Jewish, needs to convert. But in his heart, that's who he is. He walks with that, and that's why he wears that Star of David. In one of the days, when he was younger, he drove a, a, like a truck or a car or something, like maybe, maybe a farmer, I don't know exactly what, a tractor. And, the, and when he tilt, his Star of David necklace moved to the side and could be seen. And there were two people, elder people, very nice people, that if he said those, for me, they were redneck Texan American. That's how I, that's the, I don't know what it means even. That's what he said. <laughs> uh, they like, for him, like tattoos, Harley Davidson, and like long hair, only like a, a ponytail, like, what, like, those hardcore white American guys, Texan American guys, and he didn't notice that they noticed his Star of David. And when he went out of the tractor, so that guy looks at him, two elder people, like a couple, a man and a woman, and he's asking him, Why do you wear that Star of David? Are you Jewish? 
So he started answering him. I like whatever answered to him honestly. He said, and I love Israel and I love the Torah, I know. And then that person told him, but you know, it might kill you. So he told him why? He told him there are people that won't like the fact that you go with the Star of David on your chest. He said, but I'm proud of it. That was his answer, honest answer. He said, you know, and he moved his sleeve and showed him the tattoo of the number from the camps. And his wife is removing her sleeve as well and showing her number. Both of them are survivors from the camps. And that old, old person tells him, listen, when my father brought us to the U.S., he told us, from now on, we're not Jewish, we're Americans. And you need to be modest with your Judaism. And this guy is also Jewish, in, like he knows he's Jewish. But the education that he got from his father is that they now need to be Americans and not Jewish anymore. And you cannot judge a Holocaust survivor for guiding his children to hide their Judaism. It's okay to do it if you went out of the camps. You can understand why. It's okay. And now to meet a person that he's Jewish, and of course not observant, and already 70 years old, and full with tattoos, and riding bikes with his wife, you're gonna say on him, ah, he's not observant, he's not keeping Shabbat. You don't know anything about this holy person. You don't have a clue. And you don't need to be Jewish to be called a holy person. Because there are 10 tribes of Israeli tribes that are lost in the exile. And they are all from different nations. For us, you don't know. You have people in Jamaica that are believing in Zion. Where that faith came from? Why do people want to go back to Zion? You have hundreds of millions of people around the world, in Europe, in America. People that love the Holy Land of Israel. Like, why do you love Israel? Why do you have a story with Zion? Why are you waiting for the Messiah? Why do you look for a Messiah that will be Jewish from the tribe of Judah? Why are you looking for someone like that? Like, what happened with you? For an Israeli person, for a Jewish person, it's very easy to say, oh, Christians, they're following Christ. Oh, those, that, they're following this. They... It's very easy to cut and, to, and, to, and, to, and to, 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 to think that you're able to understand and to, and to, and to analyze, analyze and dissect every situation and, and put everyone in his place and to understand and criticize and like, no, I'm, I'm perfect. Why do you think you're perfect? Because the Creator made us in a certain amazing, fantastic nature. If you look now simply at reality of your creation, you are standing in the center of the world. Maybe you can also understand that there are other people as well, and they might also stand in the center of the world for themselves, but still, your life experience is that everything is happening around you. No matter how humble you are and not self-centered, still you will always going to see through your eyes, feel through your feelings, touch with your hands, walk with your legs, have your thoughts in your own mind, and the Creator will always shine for you from outside or from within. But it's always going to surround you, even if you couldn't care less about yourself, still you're not going to care about yourself. And that's your life going to be. And the Creator made it in such a beautiful and, and synchronized way that all of our amazing existence are taking place in the same time and we're not contradicting each other. I can live and the Creator can live inside of me and everything will flow in amazing, perfect harmony around me and the Godly supervision to my life will be so precise, still the, like in the breath of a hair, like every detail that will come to me will be synchronized perfectly with my thoughts, with my feelings, with my past, with my history. Everything will be perfect. And in the same time, exactly in the same time, it will all going to be as perfect for you, for them, for everyone. And also for the squirrels and the bears 
and the mountain deers, and everyone gonna be part of something so great. Now we, as individuals, we have a problem because we fell down to a world of separation. And therefore, every one of us thinks that he is a real unit that lives by itself. And therefore, he needs to take care of himself, and he needs to eat, and he needs to think, and he needs to plan, and he needs to get his rest now, and he, and he, and he, and he, all the time. He thinks about himself as an individual, when really, he's not realizing that that is your prison. That is your cell. And it's a life sentence in body. When in reality, you are part of something that is so greater than you, that is moving without you even realizing that it takes you to places. It pulls you. You see an advertisement on the side of the road and you didn't even caught it with your mind, but your awareness caught it somehow. Your thoughts are not even to it, but when you're going to stop in the next gas station, you're going to go for that drink. For that drink and not for another. And you don't know how things work. And you think, oh, which I'm going to choose? And you think that you're choosing. Like you really fell into that trap that you think that you are now choosing. But it's obvious and it's clear 100% that you're going to pick that one that you saw in the commercial a couple of hours ago. And you cannot stop yourself. There is no way in the world. And yes, in a way, in a huge way, it's canceling the free choice of a person. You want to say, hey, but I'm a free person. And the Creator told us that we should choose. But I can see clearly that I don't have a choice. If you look at your past, it's very easy to see that really in the past, you never had a choice. The fears forced you to choose that way. Your passion and your desires and your hope forced you. You didn't have a choice. The powers that were affected on you in those intersections of your life were so great. You were so scared or that you wanted to be loved so badly and you didn't know what to do. You were so lost. A woman yesterday told me over the phone, she said, I got married when I was too young. I was a very selfish mother. Selfish mother. She's crying for her 47 years old kid, a selfish mother. And she's crying and begging for him only to be happy. And she's a selfish mother. In her eyes, she sees her. I told her, listen, you don't get it. You're not selfish. You were so scared. You didn't know what to do. And when they told you, you need to marry him, or when you had that opportunity or option to marry him, it was your only choice. In your reality, you were so small, so tiny, so fragile, so lost. You couldn't choose differently. When you look at the past, very easily you can realize that the past was something that set for you by a certain destiny, by the supervision of God. That's the only way that things really sits and fits to our reality. But in our present time, we always feel that we do have a free choice. Now I can choose my next word. And I can choose if to say it or not to say it. I have that choice. I can decide. But in one moment, that time zone that I was at, that was the present time of my life, it becomes the past. Very fast it goes back, immediately. It's not here anymore. And when I look back at that moment, like we just explained, I didn't have no choice. Because I had to make a point, and people were looking at me, and I was supposed to say that thing in a way that they could understand. And I understood from the way that they were looking at me that I supposed to do something, and my thoughts, and my feelings, and the purpose of my life, and also my character, and my personality, and the things that are on my back, and on my chest, and in my mind, and in my heart, forced me to do the exact same thing that I did. So I didn't have a choice. But I felt that I had a choice, means that now I do feel that I have a choice, and that's the answer. You have a choice in the present time, but when you look back at your past, you didn't have no free choice. And those two powers contradict each other completely. They're opposite to each other. 
or that he is doing everything and there is nothing except of him and he is the one who works and he is the one who makes and he is the one who supplies and he is the one who has all the powers to move everything or that I have the free choice and I can choose. If I want to do, I'll do. If I don't want to do, I won't do. Those two realities contradict each other when you try to put them in the same time zone. But when you realize that we live in a world of illusion, then you can understand that two realities, one that is real and one that is fake, are taking place in the same time. One is right, and one is right for now. One is right, and one is right for now. And you have many situations that are like that in life. That something can be wrong, but it's really right for now. Like that it's written. It's better to violate one Shabbat for the purpose of keeping many other Shabbatot in the future. If you see that something critical happens now with you, and if you're not going to violate a certain rule, a certain obligation, you might lose the train. You might find yourself going lost. Something horrible might happen. Et la sot Hashem, when it's time to do for Hashem, eferu toratecha, violate the rules. Many righteous people violated many, many rules. Even Moses, even King David, even huge pillars of our Judaism, people that we are counting on, they allow themselves to go against the rules. They went and argued, made a fight, made a war with heaven. Moses, the best example for that. When the Creator is telling him things, Moses is going and battling like he was MMA, WWF, I don't know what he was like. <laughs> He was a wrestler. He was able to go and say, no. Hashem is telling him, all right, I'm sending my angels with you to walk with you to the land of Israel. Moses is looking at heaven and tells him, listen, if you're not coming with us, we're not going anywhere. What? What do you mean? I just told you to go. No. Moses is receiving the holy tablets. He goes down from Mount Sinai, he's realizing the situation, he takes the holy tablets, handmade by the Creator, stone that been created before of time, been written by finger of God, things that we cannot understand. First Testament ever, first Torah, first Bible, first Sefer Torah, no one can understand it. Moses takes those holy stones and smashes them to the ground. I want to see the holy rabbi that will be able to do that today. I want to see someone comes and takes something so the holiest thing ever of our generation and tear it to pieces. I want to see him. No one has the guts. No one has the power to believe in himself that he knows better. But after the fact, the Creator told Moses, Moses, Yeshar koach achash Praise you for breaking them. You aim to my real intention. That was the right thing to do. What? Where is it written? Where Moses came with that halakha, how do you learn from yourself to violate the rules in a way that will be counted as a mitzvah? Where is it written? Where is the guiding, the guiding book? Where, how, where can I find it? Tell me how I can violate in a way that will be considered as a mitzvah. And it's also written that sometimes mitzvah lishma, a mitzvah, I'm sorry, avera lishma, a sin for the sake of heaven, someone that finds a way to sin for the Creator. I don't know what it means. You need to figure out if it's really the case or not. Sometimes, avera lishma, a sin, a violation for heaven, for the sake of Hashem, is greater than mitzvah shelo lishma is greater than a mitzvah to follow the Jewish rule, to follow the halakha, but not for that high purpose of doing it only for him. Means, I want to put filin. I'm doing it for myself though. I want to have a share in the world to come. I don't want to be from those ones that their names will be with those guys who did not put filin. I don't want punishments. I want to follow the book. I'm doing it for my own inner quiet. I'm putting filin. I'm good. I'm done. I'm happy. 
it's not going to be as high as a person that now for a certain purpose, for a certain reason, he will take a decision upon himself. Take responsibility on himself, the full responsibility to violate a certain rule that it's written. Black on white in the Bible, in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Jewish book of rules. It's written that you should not do that. He will take that thing and violate it. And it will consider for him as a higher thing that what that I just finished doing. Unwrapping my tefillin in the morning. In the synagogue, with my community, reading the Bible, doing great things, the parasha of this week. Why can't I be rewarded in a higher and elevated way than a person that just violated the rules? Because his heart aimed higher. And this is why we can never judge another person. And this is why we need to remind ourselves and to wake ourselves up to the fact that no one can judge you. And if you know that your heart is to heaven, so stop listening to other people. And go with your passion, with your heart. And the Creator is with you. The only way that you can know that God is with you, is when you are with God. Now you're standing in an ignorance section. You have two options, to go to the right or to go to the left. You have a schedule of learning in the morning, only mitzvah, talking on great deeds, great actions. You have an option, waking up early to catch the early minyan, or you have another option to wake up a little bit later, but to help your wife with the children. Mitzvah, mitzvah. You have an amazing person that wants to sit and learn with you, Gemara. Amazing opportunity. And also, you have that same hour that you can go to the field and talk to heaven to do it bodedut. What are you going to do? To the right or to the left? This is diamond. Those, this is gold. What is more precious today? This is amazing. This is fantastic. How am I going to choose? How can a person know how to choose? If to the right or to the left? How will I know? There is only one way. In reality, if you open your eyes and look at the options, Nothing will answer you completely. You can never know. You can go consult with a person that will share with you from his life experience, a rabbi or an elder person or a wise person, someone with experience. He will tell you what he thinks. Really, it doesn't mean that it will answer you. He will tell you, sit and learn. And you really stand in such a situation in your life that if you're not going to talk about it with the Creator, you might drown. Even in a Beit Midrash, even with open books, even with a great friend that will sit and learn with you, you can drown because there are things that you need to pray for. No one can know that except for you, about yourself. And the opposite as well. You're going to say to yourself, all right, I heard from my best lovers, friends, I need to do one hour. Rabbi Nachman said, and that one said, one hour every day. It's so important. And it's true. But mister, listen, you have such holes in your knowledge, there are things that only if you're going to sit with a good friend in front of open books, he will be able to straighten you up. Because you, with your craziness, even five and six and ten hours in the fields won't heal you. You need some guidings. You need a friend. You need someone to coach you, someone to balance you, to bring you back to shape because you lost it somewhere on the way. And the Ibodedut won't do that for you right now. You need a buddy. You need someone to care about you. So, who can tell you what's the right answer? No one. Only you can know the real truth about yourself. And this is why it's written, Divrei Emet Nikarim. Words of truth can be recognized. By who? By you. When I ask you a question, you know if you are being honest while answering or not. When your wife, your friend, your soulmate, your, your partner, your colleague is telling you something inside of yourself, you always know the truth. Maybe it's a truth you're afraid to expose. Maybe it's a truth you don't want to deal with. Maybe it's a truth that you think that it's better to hide right now. But you know you're lying. You know you're hiding. You know exactly where you are standing in front of the truth. If you're doing it because of your fears, or you're doing it because of your love. If you're doing it because you want to, or because you're afraid not to. You know the truth about yourself. When you choose to follow the truth, 
to follow feelings that are attached to truth, like all the positive ways of thinking, like having hope, having trust in God, being positive, being generous, being nice, trying to build, trying to be happy, trying to honor, to respect, all good kinds of attributes, you are on the right lane. You're with God, and then you can know, even if you cannot see it, that God will be there with you, that He is with you. But when you're choosing based on your fears, on your anger, on terror that is running and pressuring your mind, even because you're weak, but you still choose out of your weakness to attach yourself to your dark side, you're with the evil inclination, with the sitracha, and the Creator will not be there because you chose to lie. And He is the God of truth. Hashem Elohim Emet. And that's the advice of how really to serve God with truth. This is why it's written, Hashem Elokechem Emet. And then we're repeating it and saying it again. Hashem Elokechem Emet. Because the attachment to God is through truth. And without truth, there is no God. The God is the God of truth. And a person that says and speaks lies cannot stand in front of his eyes. Cannot stand in front of him. When you lie, he went. He already went. He went somewhere else. He's not there. When you're going to say the truth, the most humble truth, the lowest truth, admit you're a liar. Admit you're a pathetic liar. Say that you don't know the way out from all the mess that you created. In that moment, a beam of light is shining on your heart and heals you and rises you and lift and shift you to places that no man ever stood by those places before. Only you. And your eyes will see the straight path and your heart will be the vessel to contain the bounty. When you choose to go with the truth, you chose to go with God. And your soul will shine no matter what darkness surrounds you. I bless us all to attach ourselves to that attribute of truth, Midata Emet, and to know that there is an inner truth inside of us that can easily be recognized. But we need to be brave to choose it, to grab it, and to hold it, and never let go. Thank you. Thank you very much. May Hashem bless us all. Amen. Thank you. The world is not existing. Because Olam Milchon Elem, the world is just blocking the light of truth. The world called Alma de Shika, world of light, is just a fake. We're just inside of an illusion. It's just a fake. We're just inside of an illusion. We're just inside of an illusion.